for the record to start. Yeah, there you go. All right. Andrew, thank you very much. And to everybody, uh, thank you for spending part of your day with us, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for, for coming on and uh, participating with us in this webinar today. Uh, for this webinar, we'll be focusing on the Atlantic Ocean. We did that one for the Pacific a couple of days ago, uh, but a lot of the content will be the same, just some of the images will be focused a little bit more on the Atlantic uh, as opposed to the Pacific. And once again, I'm Darren Fergurski. I'm the Operations Branch Chief at the National Weather Service's Ocean Prediction Center, and I'm going to share my screen here momentarily. And allow you to be able to see my presentation. So I think we're there. And I'm going to go into present mode. Very good. So if you have trouble seeing this, let me know. Uh, Andrew, are we good? Uh, yes, I, we can see your screen. Thank you very much. All right, so we'll get started. And, and first, I just want to introduce the centers. Uh, the Ocean Prediction Center that I work and the National Hurricane Center where Chris Lancy works, my counterpart there at the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch, are part of nine centers uh, as part of the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. Amongst those centers are the Aviation Weather Center, the Space Weather Prediction Center, the Storm Prediction Center, Climate Prediction Center. Uh, there's the Weather Prediction Center that uh, focuses on heavy rain, uh, heavy snow, doing surface analyses across the continental United States and other places nearby. Uh, we have our NSEP Central Operations that keeps everything going, especially from an IT infrastructure perspective. And then our Environmental Modeling Center uh, works on developing and implementing computer models to help us forecast better in the near term as well as the long term. And so we're part of those centers and our focus is on the uh, marine environment. And uh, at the Ocean Prediction Center, uh, the area that you see here in the Atlantic is the area that we cover in blue, uh, the lighter blue for the high seas and overlapping those high seas in the darker blue just off the coast of the eastern coast of the U.S. are some zones that are offshore zones as well as our VOBRA and NAPTEX forecast uh, cover. In the green to the south, that's the uh, marine area covered by the tropical analysis and forecast branch uh, for high seas purposes in the light green and overlapping that high seas area will be their offshore zones in the darker green. Uh, radio facts charts from both centers will go out to Europe and Africa, but for the high seas purposes in the offshore zones, the area in the green and the blue are the areas that we cover in the Atlantic. Just to give you a sense of the Pacific, uh, the blue and the green areas um, similar in the uh, Pacific side, with the high seas and the offshore zones. Note that uh, the purple area in the tropical Pacific, uh, west of Tapiz area and to the south of OPC's area is an area covered by the Honolulu Forecast Office, offshore areas around the Hawaiian Islands in the darker purple and the lighter purple shades are the Pacific high seas areas covered by that office. Note that the Ocean Prediction Center also is adjoined by the Alaska offices to the north, they're offshore zones, kind of in the salmon color, or yeah, they're coastal areas in the salmon color, they're offshore zones in the lighter blue there, which are high seas from OPC overlap. WMO med areas, I wanted to bring this up because in the United States, by all the centers that I just described, we cover med areas four and 12, and those are the areas which we in the National Weather Service are the authoritative voice uh, for high seas warnings uh, to help in near critical decision making. Other nations around the globe, their national meteorological and hydrological services cover other med areas that you can see here on the map. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that uh, area 16 now covered by Peru uh, was done by the uh, National Weather Service, I think specifically by the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch, but that was uh, given to Peru not too long ago uh, when Peru was able to establish a consistency of service and take that over. Uh, so again, we do areas four and 12 in the rest of the world. You can see uh, the areas divided up there. So why do we do what we do? Well, focusing on the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, uh, this map I think really uh, says quite a bit in that over the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, each season, there are about 80, probably just a little over 80, just hurricane force extra tropical lows that traverse particularly major shipping routes, uh, which pose a danger to any vessels uh, going uh, across those areas. And so there's a lot of uh, hurricane force lows 
not to mention the vast numbers of just gale, I should, I should say just, these are pretty hazardous too, but gale and storm force conditions uh, that result in upwards of five figures in the number of warnings that we issue for gale, storm, hurricane force, as well as freezing spray, uh, again, covering the North Atlantic and the North Pacific. These can definitely pose a danger to uh, traffic and we wanna make sure that people are aware as early as possible. So avoidance plans, for example, can be done as soon as possible, knowing it takes about 14 to sometimes maybe 21 days to cross a big ocean. Why we also do our work? Well, we, um, Chris and I are both signed up for to uh, uh, a subscription service from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency which provides alerts of issues that may be going on in the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, or actually in the Pacific uh, Atlantic, and sometimes even the Indian Oceans, uh, regardless of area. In a lot of cases, those alerts will give things like cable laying, space debris, derelict vessels, uh, you know, just um, ocean cleanup type of activities. Uh, but there are several cases, unfortunately, where we get alerted to things like distress signals people overboard, uh, ship sinking, and the like. Really, you know, dangerous situations. Maybe not all caused by the weather, but some certainly likely to have been caused, at least in part, by the weather. And on this slide here, there were actually 15 events, at least 15 events of just those things like distress signals, people overboard, ship sinking, from November the 21st to December the 3rd. So you have quite a bit of issues out there for the vulnerable mariner which again shows why our information passed along to you hopefully allows you to make critical decisions for the safety of life at sea. Also why we do what we do, uh, we wanna make sure that vessel avoidance is, is done as quickly as we can. This is from September 8th of 2021. It's an example of, of ship avoidance with a satellite image superimposed over basically an AIS uh, representation of vessels out over the open ocean. You can get things like this from marine traffic or other types of apps like that or websites. This one is from Sea Vision, run by I think the Department of Defense. But in this case, I think this is Larry. You can see out over the open ocean. Uh, this is Nova Scotia here, the northeast coast of the United States and well south of Nova Scotia. I think this was Larry that was gonna move a little bit north, northwest and eventually northeast. Fortunately, in this case, because of the good forecast sent out well in advance by both of our centers, uh, led by the Hurricane Center, in this case with the tropical system, there's a wide swath of vessel avoidance here in the midst of the uh, broad cyclone that, that Hurricane Larry was. And this is our goal. Sometimes we see vessels that stray way too close, so we really want to avoid that as much as possible. In this case, though, there, I think this is a very good example of vessel avoidance and uh, it's, it's in situations like this that we hope that people are, are taking stock and taking heed of the watches and warnings and the forecast, getting out of harm's way as quickly as possible. At the Ocean Prediction Center specifically, we issue uh, with the forecasters uh, manually or automatically, in some cases, over 150 products each day. We do surface analyses uh, in conjunction with the centers, uh, the Weather Prediction Center, Hurricane Center, TAFB, Honolulu Forecast Office, showing uh, the analyses of highs and lows and the fronts uh, across much of the Northern Hemisphere. Those are done uh, six times a day in a global sense and every three hours, kind of a little bit more focused in the uh, United States and areas around that. We also do a graphical forecast of surface charts going out to 96 hours extending out to 120 if there are hazards, wind wave charts that you can get through radio fax or FTP mail, 500 millibar charts, wave period charts and the like, along with sea state analyses. Uh, these are things that are on the radio fax schedule that can gather via FTP mail and are there for you in a low bandwidth way to help you uh, be better informed of things as you plan your voyages across an ocean. From an alphanumeric sense, we have offshore forecasts, uh, Navtex forecasts, we have Vobra uh, forecasts uh, in our high seas, uh, which uh, satisfy our role in the global maritime uh, distress and safety system. Uh, but a lot of the other two products, other products like the Navtex and the Vobra are done via high to medium frequency broadcasts done by the Coast Guard. Offshore forecasts, you can get those over the internet. Sometimes they're broadcast over NOAA weather radio. Uh, but these are things that are available to you, uh, again, to help make uh, your decisions and to understand as much about the weather 
as is possible. Ocean Prediction Center's website, ocean.weather.gov, something real easy to remember. Again, ocean.weather.gov, where you can get all this information and more at your fingertips. We also do a suite of products in the Pacific, similarly to the Atlantic, as well as over the uh, high latitudes and parts of the Arctic. We do surface analyses, uh, surface forecasts, wind wave forecasts, um, sea surface temperature analyses. Uh, we have, uh, we have um, uh, experimental freezing spray products there. And in conjunction with uh, all those things, we have the NOAA component of the U.S. National Ice Center as part of the Ocean Prediction Center. And that's the Ice Services branch of the Ocean Prediction Center, the website there, usicecenter.gov, which does ice analysis, forecasting, and decision support services, not just for the Arctic, but for parts of the Antarctic. Uh, did a briefing, uh, some of those uh, analysts did a briefing for our senior leadership today, talking about the extent of the icing over parts of the Bering Sea and around Alaska, which has been, had some pretty good growth due to storm systems and cold weather of late, but a significant uh, ice coverage well below normal in parts of Hudson Bay uh, due to uh, some of the tracks of the systems and the warmth that's been going on, just, just not just through the central U.S., but for parts of central and eastern Canada. At the Ocean Prediction Center, and Chris will talk about this likewise at the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch, we do a graphical forecast. We call them grids. They're graphical forecasts as part of the National Digital Forecast Database. If you go to digital.weather.gov, you can see these forecasts uh, over the continental United States, as well as for the oceanic domain. Over the oceanic domain, you can get wind gusts, wind speed, uh, wave heights, the hazards associated with those. And uh, these go out across a wide swath of both oceans in the tropical Pacific and the tropical Atlantic. At the Ocean Prediction Center, uh, we're still uh, just about 250 miles off each coast of the U.S. And it is our goal to expand those as soon as we can uh, farther offshore uh, to match what the other offices are doing uh, and, and have that uh, graphical gridded information available to you. You can see the output from some of the graphical information on the right, winds and significant wave height on the left, the one with the winds, the yellow colors represent a gale force or stronger winds, brown sort of represented storms. If we had a hurricane force conditions, they would have been in a uh, red, a brighter red color. So how do we do what we do? Well, everything starts with analyses and uh, in an understanding of what's going on with observations. So over the oceans, we do rely heavily on buoy information. We rely heavily on ship observations, uh, but where gaps are though, of those exist, uh, we rely really heavily on satellite imagery. And in the left image on this screen, if you were 22,500 miles above the earth and could breathe, you would see, and this is a picture over the Pacific, but you would see south of Alaska and south of the Aleutians, a low pressure system represented kind of by this comma head here with a frontal system extending to the southeast and then back toward the southwest to the northwest of Hawaii. There's another low pressure center over the western Aleutians, other lows over the Gulf of Alaska near the northwest United States. And there's probably one off of the uh, near the left side of the screen over here. Uh, we use satellite imagery to help us understand where the major weather systems are where the hazards are associated with those. And hopefully we can validate those satellite observations with actual raw observations, again, from ships or from other satellite imagery, such as on the right, uh, there is through a polar orbiting pass, something that goes from pole to pole, so kind of like in swaths, a uh, representation of wave height via what we call an altimeter uh, swath, uh, which kind of senses really, um, really finely uh, differences in wave heights. And in this case, near the uh, eastern edge of a real tight comma signature from a hurricane force low over the Atlantic based in 2020, 59 foot seas uh, with a hurricane force low uh, there. Satellite information is also able to help us detect the wind speed and direction associated with systems. And in this case, taken off the east coast of the US back in January of 2018, there was a very wide area of gale force and stronger winds from the northeast coast of the United States and off of Nova Scotia, south to off of east of the Carolinas and off of, you know, further south, off of the southeast coast. Yellows represent the gale force winds, the browns are storms. And in this case, there was a real strong low pressure system with hurricane force winds um, off of the coast of Virginia and North Carolina wrapped up that way. And again, it's our hope that 
if the ship avoidance was really uh, heated in this case, you want to make sure you avoid this. But we also see in this case how it would be difficult for any vessels to try to get into a port navigating such a broad area of extratropical um, storm force and hurricane force winds. So once we have all the information, we uh, assess which models are kind of doing the best or which models has the best track record of late, and then strive to make a forecast going out for the next seven days. In this image here, there's an example of the US's global forecast system in yellow, uh, overlaid with the European Center's medium range weather forecast in orange. In this case, you can see they're very, very similar. This is from December 7th of 2021, beta around 3Z. And highs and lows, pretty similar in terms of location. Uh, maybe one difference would be that the European, in this case, near about 30 north, um, had a indication of a low where maybe the GFS just had a trough. Based on, again, observations and track record of late, uh, we would assess which model is doing the best over which period of the forecast, and then look at the wind output, look at the wave output, make the best forecast over the next seven days that we can. And this image goes to show why observations are so important to help the models be as good as they can be, and at least at a minimum, help forecast your situational awareness. I use this quite a bit. Uh, this may be a little bit difficult to see, but on this image from July of 2015, so it's a while ago, Nova Scotia is up to the upper left, and the low pressure center on this screen is here near the uh, east part of a comma where then a front kind of extends off to the uh, east and the south. With the arrow, it points toward actually a vessel observation of 65 knots from the northwest. In this case, we had storm warnings up. We didn't have hurricane force wind warnings in effect. This observation was key to OPC forecasters being able to update its forecast to warn any other vessels in the vicinity of the strength of this system. One thing I want to point out, though, is that even though the models have gotten much, much better over the years, they aren't perfect. And in this case, this was the GFS forecast from the same time, about the same time as the observation. Uh, you can note here in the yellow is the observation pointing with the wind from the northwest to the southeast at 65 knots. But note in this case, instead of the low being to the northeast of the observation, which matches what the observation was showing, the model forecast had it just south and southwest of where the observation was. So as a result, the model actually had a southeast wind where indeed the actual observation had it from the Northwest. The difference was very, very subtle. I mean, you're talking about maybe a degree in longitude or latitude, both combined at the most. But that difference um, could make a substantial difference in how the forecast verifies and in our ability to make sure we have a good forecast out. So I emphasize again, the importance of observations because globally, um, there aren't that many observations over those global oceans. In this case, this was taken from the ship observations team that I chair. This is back from October of 2020, though I think little has changed since then. The areas in the red and the pinks uh, represent locations where there aren't too many observations at all, almost like zero. And then you get upwards of the blues and the greens where it gets better. But still, where there are blue boxes, that represents a monthly frequency of 26 to 250 a day, which taken on the low end could mean as few as one per grid box per month, which isn't very many. So any observations that we get, uh, we're grateful for. And so in your times out in the ocean through your efforts with the Voluntary Observing Ship Scheme or other ways you can get observations to us, you know, we're grateful for them. We really appreciate them. And here's another example of how observations are so important. Uh, through those uh, scatterometer swaths where polar orbiters are able to take stock of what the wind speed and directions are, are, are likely to be, notice that there are gaps in the swaths. And between those gaps, sometimes it just happens to be where the center of the low is. Uh, we certainly uh, need more observations to help fill in those gaps. And in this image here, there's one or a couple actually little gale flags. There's a gale flag right here in yellow, south of Nova Scotia, a couple other gale flags due east of Delmarva, south of um, Long Island. So last thing I want to mention about observations, uh, the WMO has uh, requirements for, in this case, I note air pressure measurements for global numerical weather prediction. The goal is observations taken every 15 kilometers and every 60 minutes. But the goal just to make a significant improvement for air pressure is just every 100 kilometers taken every six hours. So if we could get that, wow, what a difference that would be. 
And for high resolution numerical weather prediction, which all agencies across the globe are really working toward, a goal would be to have observations every 10 kilometers taken every 60 minutes. Things that we're doing at the Ocean Prediction Center to really help, I'll say like uh, critical decision makers, help mariners plan for things such as the US Coast Guard. We're providing decision support services to the US Coast Guard off of the East Coast. We're looking to expand that off the Pacific Coast. In turn, then the US Coast Guard can be uh, better able to plan for eventualities like uh, uh, rescue missions, or unfortunately it would take place recovery missions, but they can be uh, more attuned to what the weather is going to be. And sometimes they pass these uh, decision support service briefings that we do once a week on Wednesdays off to the Mariner via things like Gov Delivery. But there's a look ahead to hazardous conditions just over the next uh, seven days, focusing on the hazards in just a few slides, getting people a little bit more prepared for avoidance, particularly with, through, the, uh, through the Coast Guard and their help to us. We also do decision support services uh, for things like on the right, uh, there are occasional instances where we'll support uh, uh, utility recoveries. So there was a, a vessel called the Coimbra uh, that was sunk back in World War II that was very slowly seeping oil out uh, from, from as part of its old cargo. And some of that was dirtying beaches and putting globs out there. And so what it was decided to do is get a, a salvage mission to try to get some of that oil out. We provided decision support services, I think, for two to three weeks uh, daily uh, from our national digital forecast database so divers and vessels could do it safely uh, and, and, and get that out uh, without, you know, again, putting more oil out there or causing harm to individuals. So we work on things like that. And all of the information that we strive to provide, particularly over the national digital forecast database, we want to be able to have that as part of ECDIS, the Electronic Chart and Display Information Service. I believe I have the acronym correctly, um, but it's 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 right to be able to be displayed over ECDIS. And that can help in terms of a vessel's um, whole suite of information services that's achieved through ECDIS, such as other data management uh, from the a vessel, other organizational activities on the vessel. And I think it's it's prime for weather to be able to be incorporated into that. And again, I think the National Digital Forecast Database will be a good contributor to ECDIS. I just have a couple more, a couple, three more slides left uh, talking about the high seas forecast a little bit. I mentioned that as our mandatory contribution to GMDSS. And right now, sometimes they can get very, very long. You add the active weather and the extra tropical uh, period of time, uh, plus you add some, some tropics, they can get upwards of 15,000 characters or more, which is a lot for a, a, uh, a vessel operator and a person trying to make critical decisions to understand. And so what we're looking toward is kind of uh, maybe streamlining how the high seas forecast are produced, maybe more like those NGA um, and, um, alerts that I showed a little bit earlier, also trying to incorporate polygons into those uh, because it's really difficult right now when model forecasts as well as satellite data are able to resolve so many, many more low pressure systems than we could see 10, 15, or 20 years ago. You know, at that time, we might be able to see one or two, or we could draw one low and, and have all the conditions associated with that one low. But now, model data as well as satellite data are showing that around systems, particularly uh, very strong systems, well-developed systems, you can have as you know, multiple low pressure systems. And on this map here, this is just back from December 8, 2021, kind of around and south of Greenland, the model was showing upwards of, I think, seven or eight individual low pressure systems, um, of which there even could have been more than that when you add in lows from deep convection. So do we want to write a separate gale warnings for each one of these lows, which would you know, cause you know, many more thousands of characters? Or could we just cover the area like in the yellow of the polygon here to share with someone where the main hazards were and then where they were going to go? And I got a sense that's the latter that's true, um, the area covered by the hazards, probably the main thing. It'll be much easier, much simpler to make decisions from. Note that with the uh, NOAA component of the U.S. National Ice Center as part of the Ice Services Branch for the Ocean Prediction Center, forecasting and decision support at high latitudes will become more and more important as uh, the ice seems to be um, freer in those high latitudes for longer during the season. Uh, more vessels gradually are taking advantage of that. Uh, utilities and things are looking for you know, good, uh, exploration purposes there. Uh, but note that in those areas, vulnerability is still quite high, even though in some places land can be close. 
emergency services could still be a long ways away. Um, so decision support at high latitudes is and will continue to be very important. And we're going to work with our ICE services branch to incorporate their ICE analysis and forecasting into decision support uh, for winds and for waves. Last thing I'll mention, social media, Facebook uh, uh, link is there, Twitter handle at NWSOPC, and you'll find things out like uh, hazardous weather events that are there, uh, storyboards that a couple of our senior forecasters put, uh, kind of summarizing the last season from a hurricane force perspective. A lot of information on social media, and you can gain a lot there uh, about hazards as well as just stories of interest. And with that, I'll wrap up the presentation there. My email address is there. If you need to reach out to me for any questions, uh, feel free to do so. And Andrew, I will turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Darren. Um, we do have one question uh, so far. And as a reminder, you can type your questions in the question box. Uh, this question is from Bruce Wagner. What communication system do you use to warn vessels when they are far from land? Thinking about thinking of sailboats out at sea crossing the Atlantic. So the communication systems out there, we there's low bandwidth ways that people can get. I'll turn my screen on here. There's there's low bandwidth ways where people can get information such as uh, through the radio fax and through FTP mail. Uh, those are a couple of ways. We still have uh, through, I think through satellite technology, such as through Inmarsat and through Iridium, uh, you can get our high seas forecasts uh, that way. Uh, unlike over the, like the continental United States, where sometimes we might have a direct feed into an emergency manager or to a media member, um, uh, Ocean Prediction Center is typically not able to reach directly to every single vessel that's out there. Uh, it's possible we could get contacted uh, at our phone number, uh, but uh, 301, 6831520 if you're in distress. Um, but uh, what could happen if you're in distress out there is you could reach out to somebody like the Coast Guard or through your emergency channels in which then the Coast Guard or whomever it is would get to us to help us provide them uh, with what's going on for, for relay that way. So I'd also just take advantage of the low bandwidth ways that you can get information, uh, utilize the GMDSS services like the high seas forecast, Hopefully through that way, you're able to uh, make the critical decisions you need to avoid harm's way. The last thing I'll mention on that one is that there are services out there uh, that uh, can provide for the general public uh, routing services, which we do not provide. Uh, from the public-private partnership standpoint, uh, we, do, we don't get into individual routing, um, but that could be a situation where if you knew you needed to uh, have some services uh, like that specialized for you, you could work with something like that. I can't hear you, Andrew. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. That's all the questions that we've received so far. Um, if you have more questions for Darren um, or for Chris, who's about to go, uh, you, uh, we'll ask those at the end, but continue to type your questions in the box. Uh, looks like you have unmuted Chris. So uh, without further ado, Chris Lancy will discuss the waters, uh, the tropical waters south of 30 north latitude. Now go Thanks, ahead, Chris. Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Can you hear me and see my slides? Yes, we can. Great. All right. Well, that was wonderful uh, overview from uh, Darren Fergurski about the Ocean Prediction Center. So we're a sister agency. Uh, we provide wind and wave forecasts and issue warnings for the tropical latitudes uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. Uh, as well as the eastern North Pacific uh, tropical latitudes. So today, I'm going to focus on what we do in the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf. Uh, again, my name is Chris Lancy. I'm the branch chief of the Tropical Analysis Forecast Branch here at the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida. Um, so who are our customers for TAFP? Well, obviously, they're the Mariners and the Mets. But maybe not those Mariners and Mets. It's these Mariners and Mets. It's giant cruise boats. It's the uh, huge... Uh, cargo ships, it's oil tankers, it's anyone uh, on a giant personal yacht, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard. So those are the mariners that uh, we're responsible for on a daily basis in our 10 million square nautical miles of area. Uh, the Mets are the Caribbean meteorologists, and so they use our products as well to help inform what they're doing from a National Weather Service at their individual country. 
So the Mariners and the Mets, those are our customers here at the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch. So Darren already showed this, just to reiterate. In green, on the right side, it shows the Gulf of Mexico, the uh, Caribbean Sea, and the Western Atlantic. The dark green are our offshore zones, and I'll get into a little more detail about what that is. But that shows the 5 million square nautical miles in the tropical Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf that we're responsible for. Uh, right along the coast, uh, that's more the province of the uh, weather forecast offices of the National Weather Service. So 60 miles and closer to the coast, that's the local weather forecast office. 61 miles and further offshore, that's us. So there are an amazing number of ships out over the open ocean. Uh, when I took this position three years ago, I was shocked to see on marinetraffic.com just how many hundreds of ships there are, uh, whether it's the red, which are oil tankers, or the light blue, which are tugboat and special craft helping with the, uh, the uh, oil platforms. Uh, the uh, green are the cargo ships. Uh, the orange are the uh, fishing vessels. Uh, the dark blue are the cruise ships. Uh, and the purple are the uh, giant personal yachts. So you can see there's hundreds of ships out there. Uh, unfortunately, we only get measurements from about 5% of them. So as Darren mentioned, the uh, VOS program, the Voluntary Ship Observer Program, is something we're encouraging mariners to participate in. The more data, the more observations of winds and waves and pressures that we get, the better forecasts that we can provide the mariners in return. So it's a reciprocal uh, relationship there. So a little bit about the meteorology and what we call climatology, what is expected. Um, during June to November, our focus is on tropical storms and hurricanes, but this time of year, we, we don't have those typically. Uh, and instead, we're dealing with extra tropical cyclones. Um, so systems that are uh, what we call baroclinic that have fronts, cold fronts and warm fronts. And so that's responsible, for example, for gales just off of uh, the east coast of Florida, uh, gales off the uh, east coast of Mexico, especially down near uh, Veracruz and Tampico. Uh, but we also have gap wind events that uh, can cause gale force winds as well. So just north of Colombia and Venezuela, there is a very favored area for gap winds because of the interplay of the uh, Colombian low uh, as well as the Bermuda high. So you really get accentuated winds. As anyone who sails the Caribbean knows, that's, that's a very favored area for strong winds all the time. The yellow are areas where we have gales on occasion. Um, so it could be Florida Straits, uh, could be um, just off the coast of, uh, of Honduras and Nicaragua as well. Uh, so just about any part of our area of responsibility can have a gale. Uh, storm force events are less frequent, um, but they can happen. Uh, I don't think we've ever had a hurricane force wind event in the winter time. So that's very different from Ocean Prediction Center. This is their peak season up at the higher latitudes, north of 31 North. For us, we do have threats uh, but it does not get to hurricane wind events in our area of responsibility in the Caribbean, Gulf, or West Atlantic. So what are some of the tools that we use? Uh, as, as was already mentioned, getting measurements from ships is critical because the captain and crew are the ones actually observing what's going on, uh, and that's uh, critical information. Uh, we're also fortunate there are moored and drifting buoys that the operated by the National Data Buoy Center um, part of uh, NOAA as well. And so those are really critical because they give us wind and pressure and they also give us wave information. So we get the significant wave height, we get the main periodicity and the direction of those waves as well. Uh, so in addition to those in situ or local uh, observational sources, we use remote ones as well. And so the colored uh, numbers are values from a satellite called an altimeter that give us wave heights that are accurate to the nearest foot or one third of a meter. Incredible instruments. And you can see they, they provide basically a line as they're going around the earth. Uh, also, as Darren mentioned, we have scatterometers. And so these are another type of radar in space that gives us wind speed and direction over the open ocean. Uh, unfortunately, one of those just got decommissioned by the European Space Agency. Uh, so we have somewhat less coverage, uh, both in our area and OPC going forward, 
Um, so it's a bit of a gap for us uh, because those tools are so tremendous. Additionally, we've got an amazing platform called the Geostationary Satellite. And a few years ago, the next generation of these was launched and it's called GOES-16. It gives resolution down to about a kilometer, about a half a mile, uh, as well as temporal resolution. Sometimes we can get images uh, up to a, uh, every minute. And for us that are marine forecasters, where there may be a dearth of in situ measurements, having the satellite imagery really helps identify, for example, where the location of the lows are, um, which really you can't get any other way. And during hurricane season, it's, it's extremely indispensable uh, as well. And so these platforms, they're launched by NASA, uh, and, but once they're checked out, they're run by NOAA at a facility in Suitland, Maryland, and they're about a billion dollars each. Um, so they're, uh, they're invaluable sources of information, not just for the forecasters, but for the computer models as well to help inform them going forward. Another set of tools, speaking of models. Um, so we use wind models, uh, and generally these are global models, for example, the global forecast system that the National Weather Service runs, as well as the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. Uh, and so we can use the deterministic, that is the high resolution version. We can also use an ensemble that is a, uh, a multiple runs of the same model at slightly reduced uh, resolution. And so we take a blend of these models, as well as what's going on now. So the models help provide the forecast. And that populates a database of winds for us. It's a gridded database. We actually call it, it's called Graphical Forecast Editor, or GFE. And so we have a six, day, uh, uh, six days worth of wind grids. And then we actually run a model to provide waves. And so it's called the Nearshore Wave Prediction System. And it gives us wind waves as well as swell that uh, the waves generated uh, at a distance. And so we have consistent wind and wave information for all of our area responsibility. And then we use these grids of winds and waves to inform all of our products. And so we want to make sure that, uh, that we are, are doing the best on the meteorology and oceanography, have a great database of that, and then we can go forward and provide the products. Lastly, another set of tools are the workstations. Uh, we're moving toward uh, getting into one system called the Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System. And so AWIPS uh, is also used at the local forecast offices. It's also starting to be used by the other national centers. And the great thing is we can share gridded information. We can compare borders. Because you as a mariner, you don't give a darn um, that, well, you don't want to see any change in service or products if you're going across, say, 31 North, just east of Jacksonville. And so we want to make sure there's no discontinuity in, in the forecasts. Uh, for you, it should be seamless. And so we have to work together to make sure that's the case. So those are some of the tools that we use on a daily basis. A uh, question did come up uh, in the last talk, you know, how do you get weather forecasts over the open ocean? And it really depends on where you're at and what technology you have on your vessel. So if you're within about 25 nautical miles ashore, the NOAA weather radio, uh, if you're within U.S. territorial waters, uh, can provide that. Uh, the further offshore you are, uh, you do have the high frequency and very high frequency radio. And so that's both the voice broadcasts as well as the radio facts. Uh, they provide graphical information about the predictions. So if you have a high frequency uh, radio receiver, you can get that. There's also Navtex, which is a medium frequency uh, that provides a text forecast near U.S. ports. Um, and then, as Darren also mentioned, the Global Marine Distress and Safety System, GMDSSS. In the past, Inmarsat, as a private company, has provided satellite um, communications that provide the high seas forecast, which is mandated by the International Maritime Organization. And now there is a competitor called Iridium, uh, that's uh, wanting to also provide the uh, GMDSS forecast information as well, uh, which is good for the mariner that there's, there's options becoming available. Uh, there's also FTP mail where a user can send an email requesting a specific either text or graphical product, and you can get that back by email. So if you have email access, but maybe not internet, FTP mail may be an option. And then finally, we're trying to take our information here at the National Hurricane Center 
and provide it on a low bandwidth website called the Marine Composite page, which I'll show in detail going forward. So it really depends where are you over the open ocean and what technology you have on your vessel. We don't. We want to make sure that regardless of what uh, we have, you have available, that you can get a hold of our forecast and make decisions to, to keep you and your crew and your cargo safe. So let's look at some of the products that we provide here at the National Hurricane Center. The first is the Unified Surface Analysis, which really is a multi-agency product. So we do the little latitudes of the Atlantic, Caribbean, Gulf, and East Pacific. Those Forecasters fortunate to live in Honolulu do the Central Pacific. Uh, Darren's group at the Ocean Prediction Center does the high latitudes of the Pacific and the Atlantic. And the folks uh, in the Weather Prediction Center do the uh, United States and Canada uh, minus Florida. Uh, apparently, they don't think Florida is part of the United States. And believe me, after you've lived here in Florida for a while, there's there's some little bit of truth to that. Uh, so what is what was done today? So let's look at the 12Z map that was done today by uh, by Heather N Nepal, in collaboration with OPC, WPC, and HFO. So if you look over the Atlantic right now, there is a fairly robust cold front uh, that's just uh, east of Bermuda right now. There's a prefrontal trough there, it's associated with some convection. There's a weak ITCZ, intertropical convergence zone, and monsoon trough over West Africa. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, there's there's not a lot of features. We would indicate if there's any warnings in place, any gale warnings. And so today it's fairly benign, especially for December, uh, though we don't have any of these gales in our area of responsibility today. Another key product, and it's our only uh, pure text product, is the tropical weather discussion. And so this focuses on an assessment of what's going on now, we have one product for the Atlantic and one for the Pacific, as well as a five-day overview of what the forecast is. And if there's any gales in place or during hurricane season, if there's any tropical storms or hurricanes, we focus on that as a, as a special feature. So we can take a look at what the, uh, the tropical weather discussion uh, was provided today. And so this was just issued by Heather Nepal a few minutes ago. And uh, again, there's no special features. So again, no gales, which is good news for today. So this is for the Mariner or the Caribbean Met, for those that want more information a bit about the why, not just the forecast of the winds and waves, but a little bit more about the reasoning behind it. So you can get that in the tropical weather discussion. So for our wind and wave forecasts and the warnings, uh, all of what we put together is encapsulated in our gridded forecast. So these grids have grids of significant wave height. Uh, it's got grids of 10 meter winds. That's a 33 foot wind standard for meteorologists measuring the winds. And from those grids fall out our graphical products, whether it's on the internet or radio facts transmitted by the Coast Guard uh, or the GMDSS mandated high seas forecast as well. And so everything comes out of our grids. Uh, which allows us to uh, really focus on the, the meteorology and oceanography and then the products. Uh, aren't, they're not automated, but they're, much of it is, is is streamlined to make it uh, quickly efficient. So let's take a look. High seas forecast. And this is one required by all uh, vessels uh, of a certain size to have access to. Uh, and uh, we do this four times a day. Uh, we focus on the big stuff. So this is not for the 20 foot fishing boat. This is for these giant uh, ships over the open ocean or anyone over the open ocean. And so we're focusing on at least 25 knots or greater or seas of eight foot or greater. Uh, so we can just take a quick look at what the forecast was from today. And this was just issued by Evelyn Rivera this morning. And again, no warnings in place. And she's discussing uh, some mixed swell and some uh, Northeast winds. Uh, in the central Atlantic associated with that cold front, uh, a little bit near the Mona Passage of some winds and seas as well. Fairly quiet for us this time of year. So to provide more detail and to go further out in time, uh, we have our offshore zones. So each of these polygons, we provide five days worth of predictions, again, of winds, of waves, and the warnings. Uh, and we also, um, are providing any warnings that are in place in there, whether it's tropical storm or hurricane warnings during the summer and fall, or this time of year, it could be gale or storm force winds. 
Uh, the nice thing with the offshore zones is we have a, a really uh, easy to use GUI that, for example, can tell you. So if you're, uh, for example, just north of Columbia, you can see that uh, the winds right now are about 20 knots and they're going to speed up a little bit to 25 knots over the next couple of days and seas reaching 10 feet. Uh, so each of these uh, easily accessible and then the, the synopsis, so a little bit of reasoning is also included in there. So you get an idea, what is the forecaster thinking? What are the features responsible for the, that particular forecast? Another product that's available and, and it's used quite a bit, especially by cargo ships would be the nav text. Uh, it's a text forecast and it incorporates our forecast information with some of the local weather forecast office ones as well. Uh, another one that uh, is used as the VOBRA. So it's similar to no weather radio. Uh, it is in the uh, high frequency spectrum uh, and it's transmitted by uh, what by the Coast Guard. Uh, so the US Coast Guard transmits it and we're the one that provide the forecast. So this is a voice broadcast that one can access. So switching to graphics, uh, again, the Coast Guard, US Coast Guard is a big partner with us. So they main, uh, maintain a transmitter in New Orleans in order to uh, send out uh, the very high frequency graphical components. Uh, so one of the bread and butter forecasts that we provide are, are surface progs, a prognosis out through three days. So it's a day one, day two, and day three forecasts. We issue these twice a day. Um, and this uh, particular product covers the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf. Let's just take a quick look. Uh, this was the forecast um, just issued by Evelyn Revere as well as Heather Nepal. You can see three days from now, so this would be on the 19th at 12 UTC or, 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 or Zulu time, uh, that a cold front is moving across the Gulf of Mexico. But we didn't we didn't put a gale possible, so we're not anticipating it to be very strong at this point. Uh, in addition to that, we focus on well, what's going on now with the ocean? What kind of significant wave heights do we have and what's the uh, dominant uh, direction of those waves so this is our sea state analysis and it's both available on the website as well as through radio facts uh, not too much going on so i think i'll skip showing that one for today uh, for, for winds and waves making a forecast again we provide day one day two and day three uh, for the atlantic caribbean and gulf of mexico showing the wind speed and direction as a wind barb and the significant wave height in feet. Uh, all of our products are in feet right now. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's the format that we use. We understand a lot of mariners do prefer meters and provide their sea state in meters as well. So this is the forecast that Evelyn just issued. She does show a peak of up to 11 feet just north of uh, uh, Columbia. And then as that cold front uh, starts coming out, you can see the seas start ramping up quickly just south of Texas, down uh, up to nine feet. So that's an example of our wind and wave forecast. We also provide a wave periodicity and direction. Uh, certainly the most at risk for, for most vessels are very steep waves uh, with a short periodicity, you know, five to 10 seconds. And so that would uh, show up as uh, the blue colors would be a short period. Uh, and of course, uh, one hitting, uh, hitting uh, the, the vessel on the side, instead of hitting directly on the bow or the stern, would be uh, most at risk. And so having the, the dominant direction and the periodicity uh, gives an idea of, of, of the combination of that with the significant wave height of the hazard that, that could be available. Also, we provide this time of year what's called a high wind and seas graphic. So it's a snapshot of any warnings we have placed that are valid 48 hours from now. So we issue this four times a day. Uh, and we don't have any warnings out currently, so I, I, I'm not going to show the map today because it, it's, it's, it's nice and blank. We like to keep it that way the whole season, but we know we can't do that. So as vessels acquire more technology and can access uh, Internet more regularly, um, you know, the, the field's going to evolve and the communications uh, are going to be able to improve. So one step forward for that is a low bandwidth version of all our products, our grids and our graphics uh, that we host here at the National Hurricane Center. And so this is an example from two years ago where there was a, a strong cold front that, that emerged from Southeast United States and moved eastward across the, uh, the Atlantic. 
On the right side, it shows the wind barbs, and that's the standard 10 meter wind speed and direction. And the colors are the significant wave heights. So in this particular case, we are looking at gale force winds up to about 40 knots and seas reaching about eight meters or about 25 feet. On the left side is a graphical depiction of exactly what's in that text product. So instead, instead of a difficult to read text product, now you just have a visual representation every 12 hours of what's going on. And in this case, the, the blue is at least eight foot seas, about two and a half meters. The orange is winds of at least 23 knots. Uh, the stippled are a combination of both, and the red are the gale events. So for me, being able to see on the left here, a graphical depiction of the hazards is a lot easier to quickly understand and make changes to your ship routing as needed. So let's take a look at what's going on today. Uh, again, this is uh, right off the Hurricane Center website. And to get to the Hurricane Center website, it's just hurricanes.gov. And then you can click on Marine. So let's see what the forecast is that Evelyn's been working on all morning. So here's the uh, wind barbs. And again, that's a 10 meter wind. Here's the significant wave heights and colors. And here are the, the features. So it's the isobars of pressure, as well as the, the person, the forecaster drawn features. And again, from Heather Nepal's map this morning, you have the, uh, the cold front between the Bermuda and the Greater Antilles. So we step forward in time, you can see that there's a large area of, of strong winds and swell that's going to push some, some wave heights uh, up to about uh, 12 foot or about four meters southward quite a ways, uh, eventually reaching the, uh, the, uh, the Lesser Antilles near the Virgin Islands uh, going forward in time. So no gale events, but significant swell to impact the Lesser Antilles over the next few days. So this is an example of the information we provide. Our graphics end after three days, uh, but we're providing the grids out to uh, day five at this point. Uh, in the future, we may go to day four and five for our graphical forecast as well. So again, this is a quick and easy way of, of seeing what's going on. Uh, we also have um, information, not just at 10 meters. So here's, for example, our 10 meter winds uh, that are valid 12Z this morning, but we can also show them at 30 meters. And we can show them at 50 meters because we realize that vessels, uh, their profile, they are well above the ocean, especially these larger cruise ships and cargo ships and oil tankers. And so we've been asked to provide 30 and 50 meter winds. And so we're doing that. And we're using our 10 meter winds as, as the base to provide these winds at higher levels above the ocean. Uh, finally, I wanted to show an example of uh, our peak winds. So this is or this is what's going on as of this morning. And we could take a composite of what are the strongest winds over the next five days? And that's here. So this is anywhere in the forecast over the next five days, what the strongest winds. And nice thing is all the purple, which is gale force, is, is north of our area. And so uh, it looks like it's uh, fairly smooth sailing for most mariners in our area of responsibility for the next five days. So Darren talked about ship avoidance, where mariners are making good decisions in the face of extreme conditions. And I did want to show this, uh, this real nice example from Hurricane Delta back in 2020. And this was a typical day, uh, even though it was during the pandemic, uh, where all these ships are out over the open ocean on October 6th. And as Delta uh, formed and was moving just north of the Yucatan, uh, the forecast was for Delta to head north, northwest, and eventually threaten and hit Louisiana. You can see on the 7th, uh, the, the ships are, are getting out of the way. Uh, same thing, a day later, the hurricane's over the central Gulf of Mexico, and there's no ships within 100 nautical miles of it. And it's great to see mariners taking evasive action to get out of the way, not just of where the storm is now, but to forecast. Uh, the later that day, again, seeing the mariners in this case, now we're starting to see uh, most of them moving out of the way of the forecast track. And then on the 9th, all these oil tankers nestled real close to the Texas coast uh, and, and pretty much everybody out of the way um, of, the, of the way of the hurricane. And then within a couple days, after the US Coast Guard inspects the ports uh, and they can reopen, uh, things can get back to normal fairly quickly. Uh, so it's wonderful for us as forecasters to see ships Captain and crew making the right decisions and getting out of the way 
to, to safeguard their crew and their ship. We also work uh, with the US Coast Guard as does uh, the Ocean Prediction Center. And one thing that we do uh, upon requests are spot forecasts. And so this could be a vessel in distress, it could be a missing ship, it could be an aircraft that has crashed, it could be an oil spill. Uh, you know, Deepwater Horizon occurred uh, about a decade ago and that could occur again. Uh, or it could be law enforcement activities where the Coast Guard are chasing the bad guys and we don't know exactly what they're doing. They don't need to tell us, but they need a forecast because that's affecting the winds and waves are affecting what they're doing. And so back in 2020, we did 37 of these spot forecasts for a variety of things for either District 7 here in Miami, District 8 of the U.S. Coast Guard in New Orleans, uh, or the District 11 in California, or 14 in Hawaii. So, uh, so it's a key core governmental partner of us is the U.S. Coast Guard, as they do not have any forecasters in the U.S. Coast Guard. We provide the forecast and briefing support for them. So just to wrap up, I did want to point out our social media that we've been really ramping up what we provide uh, mainly by Twitter and uh, where we now do automated tweets anytime there's a warning. So if there's a warning in our air responsibility, whether it's the Caribbean, the Gulf, West Atlantic, or East Pacific, tweet goes out. So that's another way that Mariners, if you have access to Twitter, uh, especially if you're in port, you can see, uh, see that there's a warning in place. Uh, and during quiet days like now, then we would be focusing on uh, more of an educational opportunity. So climatology, for example. So from all the men and women here at the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch, uh, we're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just hurricane season, but all year round. There's our phone number. So if there's a mariner in our area of responsibility, we're happy to answer questions uh, about what the forecast is. Our Twitter handle is at NHC underscore TAP B. Um, there's our website. Uh, the simplest way to get there is just hurricanes.gov. Um, so should wrap it up. Um, hopefully this has been helpful for you. Uh, and I want you to stay safe as you're uh, um, going about to the, uh, the open oceans. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Um, we'll wait. Um, a couple minutes, a minute here to see if anyone has any more questions. Please type your question in the questions dialog box for either Chris or Darren. Um, as of right now, I haven't seen any additional questions. That's great. We we answered all the questions for them. We solved all the problems. Wonderful. <laughs> Well, this is Darren coming back on, and then Chris, if you want to go ahead and stop sharing, you feel free to do that. I see your NWS chat, but um, with with that in mind, uh, just want to take just another moment to to uh, offer everybody, uh, you know, a great wherever you're going to do this 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 holiday season upcoming. That it, it's it's great for you and yours. That everyone and and your family, yourselves, your team stay well and stay safe. And that 2022, the start of it as well as the whole year through. Uh, brings you, you know, good fortune and and a lot of happiness. Uh, note that uh, our, you know, the email address that I gave Darren Dopfergerski at NOAA.gov and and Chris, I think he had his contact information there as well. Feel free to reach out to us afterwards if you have any questions, um, something you didn't understand, just want to learn a little bit more. Feel free to reach out to both or either one of us, and we'll do the best we can to answer your questions. We got, we got one more question, but uh, let me expand this window so I could see the whole word here. Uh, where's the best place to start the learning curve for understanding prediction models and such? Mm, well, the, uh, the Comet uh, group in Boulder uh, provides uh, meteorology education and they have uh, free uh, meteorology modules and online classes that uh, that you can take to to get uh, information. Um, certainly as a mariner, you better understand the weather because that's gonna be impacting you. And if you get in trouble, you have to fend for yourself uh, until, until you can hopefully get help arrived. And so being, being able to stay safe, whether you're in a, a small fishing boat near the coast and a thunderstorm approaches, or if you're in a giant 1000 foot cargo ship and uh, in, a, in, a, in a large hurricane approaches. Um, but yeah, Comet, that would be uh, 
my suggestion. Let me see if I can find the website for it uh, while we're chatting. Yeah, that's C O M E T. If you type Comet Weather Module in Google, you might be able to. I got, yeah, I got it. Yeah. I got it. I'll put it in the net, uh, neted.ucar.edu. That one. Yep, that's it. Comet.ucar.edu. Yeah, I, I also typed it uh, individually to the person who asked that, Bruce Wagner. Yep. All right. Well, uh, with that, there are no there are no additional questions. So uh, we got a few thank yous. Um, so we'll go ahead and end the webinar. Webinar. Thank you very much, Chris and Darren. And I hope everyone has a happy holiday season. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Darren. Yeah. Thank you. Right, thank uh, you, Chris. Have a great day, everyone.